Hey everybody, my name is Pete Saronis and we are super excited that you're joining us today for our one hour webcast, which will discuss a number of topics uh, with some incredible thought leaders. My name's Pete Saronis. I will be the host today and I'm gonna knock out a few housekeeping things before I introduce our esteemed guests. We are live. Uh, we are also going to use the chat functionality for some participant engagement. My co-host Tom Connors will be manning that station and we will get to those questions probably throughout the dialogue this is meant to be a fireside chat conversation we're also going to have a couple polls one that i'll release about 10 minutes into this and one about 15 minutes prior to ending just to get some feedback from the uh audience uh we're also going to uh discuss a little bit and use a number of acronyms that we hope to share and um hopefully you will uh allow us to to explain what a lot of the video uh, challenges with smart cities, what are the um, communication and collaboration challenges are as well. And if you occasionally see somebody pop up, we're going to keep these folks spotlighted on the video. So forgive me if that happens in advance. Um, I am the chairperson for the utility supercluster. I'm the former CTO for the United States Department of Energy. Uh, we are super excited that NIST, the National Institute of Standard and Technology, is sponsoring our event today. So thank you, Michael. Uh, I appreciate that uh, you and Ben and Karen are all going to help us with telling a story about why the ecosystem is so important to build smart cities. Our goal today is to celebrate robotics, the role that the Carnegie Mellon Institute or Smart Cities Institute, Metro 21 and the university or at the University of Carnegie Mellon, uh, as well as NIST, the federal agency. And of course, from a risk perspective, uh, Mr. Bruce Walker is going to help share a perspective for us on how to manage that risk, but also celebrate the art of the possible. So with that, uh, I'm going to kick it in and just introduce everybody, their name, their title, and then uh, I'm going to ask Michael to give us some opening remarks. Okay. And for anybody joining, if you can be off video, I would really appreciate that. Um, I, I think it's, it's going to not serve as a distraction, but um, Gus Hunt, my man, if you can uh, um, go on video, that would, uh, off video, that would be great. Um, yeah, so, okay, um, here we go. We've got Michael Dunaway from the National Institute of Standard and Technology's Associate Director for Innovation and Cyber-Physical Systems. We've got Dr. Ben Schmidt, CEO and co-founder of Robotics. We've got Karen Lightman, the Executive Director of Metro 21, the Smart Cities Institute in Pittsburgh. We've got Bruce Walker, the Chief Risk Officer for Energy, but really for Critical Infrastructure at the Analysis and Resilience Center for Systemic Risk. And we're going to kick it right off with uh, with Michael and maybe give us a little bit more background on you and your role and and this this awesome opportunity you have to collaborate across government and industry. Uh, Pete, thanks a lot. And um, good afternoon or good morning to all of you. Uh, glad to have you joining us. And uh, Pete, I want to start by thanking you for hosting this event and getting this uh, getting this uh, show going here. This is a real opportunity. So as, as Pete mentioned, I'm the lead for the um, the Associate Director for Innovation at, uh, in the Cyber Physical Systems Division at NIST, but, uh, but my principal role is as the lead for the Global City Teams Challenge. And the Global City Teams Challenge, as, as Pete alluded, is a collaboration of cities, communities, private sector, industry, and nonprofits, academic research institutes, and a, a number of other federal agencies that are all engaged in smart cities movement. And uh, through the GCTC, our principal role at NIST is to serve as kind of the federal partner, the lead federal partner for a huge public-private partnership that stretches literally coast to coast. And we have a number of international partners, about 200 cities involved in this program at this stage of the game at various stages and various, uh, various opportunities. But it's a very active, um, active collaboration with one particular goal. And that is to improve the quality of life, the security, and the efficiency of cities and municipalities across the country through the use of technology, high technology systems. And beyond that, to learn from each other, to uh, gain insights into best practices, to share knowledge, uh, share uh, opportunities, and uh, basically to strengthen communities across the entire country at whatever level. And those are late major cities, uh, the metropolitan level, all the way down to uh, small towns. And then we're working in rural areas as well. So it's, a, it's a, an ongoing 
uh, public-private partnership with a lot of uh, a lot of vibrant members in it. So, Pete, thank you. No, th thank you, Michael. And, and I just want to emphasize, uh, folks, this this role Michael has, uh, you know, in the Department of Commerce within the National Institute of Standard Technologies is to truly engage industry and government. A big part of today's conversation is going to be around that partnership and what it takes. It, it doesn't happen overnight and it doesn't happen through mandate or edict. It, it takes folks like myself and the folks you see on here just bringing a community and all those of you have attended today. Hopefully you walk away wanting to be involved and we have opportunities for that. I do want to shout out Michael um, or Dr. Michael. Uh, uh, I love I love mascots in universities, but but there's a theme here. And, and with um, the Tufts jumbos, um, that's kind of neat. Uh, if you didn't know, Phineas T. Barnum was the original trustee of Tufts University, and he actually owned an elephant that uh, he acquired from the London Zoo. And that's why Tufts University and Ringling Brothers and elephants are all related. So there you have it. Uh, food for thought. Um, all right, next up, let's go right down to um, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Ben Schmidt, Robotics. Ben, a little introduction uh, from you other than your title, uh, obviously CEO and founder. Um, just a little bit about your journey and, wh and, and why you're so passionate about this space and, and, and your company and its mission. Oh, I'm gonna ask you to unmute, which I can control. There we go. Sorry about that. Uh, I'm kind of a live Zoom rookie, um, so, so there we go. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> I was hoping go. that I would get unmuted and I wouldn't have to sign it. Yes, you know, it's been yes. a long time. Um, well, no, I really appreciate being here. And I think, uh, you know, certainly there's a, a really interesting group of characters. I'm excited to have this discussion. And certainly with robotics, you know, we are a spin out of Carnegie Mellon. Uh, this December will be coming up on our fifth year anniversary. And our mission since the beginning has really been to help uh, governments, municipalities, um, starting in the United States, but certainly around the world, to better manage and maintain their infrastructure. Um, and we've done that by basically deploying sort of the most advanced technology we can uh, around machine vision, around AI, um, and using that to basically understand what's going on on infrastructure. So collecting visual data uh, and transforming that into, you know, this road is in good condition, this stop sign is in good condition, or this one's in poor condition, uh, and providing the data to communities to really better understand what they already have, um, and thereby sort of unlock the ability to better manage and maintain it. So that's you know certainly been our mission, it continues to be our mission, and it, I think it's gonna be a great discussion here about how we can, you know, not just for robotics, but I think there are a lot of companies and um, technologies in this space that, you know, really need to be unlocked at that next level, um, scaled and deployed so that we can see those meaningful impacts on our infrastructure, um, you know, and, and just generally positive uh, all around for those technologies. Well, Ben, I, I wanna just feed off a little bit of that. University of Pittsburgh, um, by way of, if I'm not forgetting, uh, New York, Westchester, uh, but you're a Pittsburgher I know at heart. Uh, folks, uh, Ben represents what a lot of, not just the smart cities ecosystem is about, but what we in the Beltway understand that we need to rely on that spirit of entrepreneurial vision and mission, what have you, uh, to really move the needle, right? The government talks a lot about engagement and collaboration and working across all kinds of uh, uh, domains and sectors. Uh, this is representative of, of that. And we're excited to hit on some of what Robotics is doing. And please, robotics.com, if I'm not mistaken, please check it out. Over 250 governments, 30 partners, over four, or 14 countries, 34 US states, this technology is deployed. And for all you government folk in here, it's got AI, machine learning, cloud computing, all kinds of data-driven data -driven decision-making stuff and, and, and nomenclature to, to get excited about. So there you go. Ben, we will come back to that story. All right, well, how was um, Robotics uh, birthed? Uh, let's move to Karen Lightman and the wonderful work she's leading as executive director for Metro 21, which in and of itself has an, an amazing story with uh, Henry Hillman and the Roots uh, back in 2009 with Traffic 21 Institute. I'm just gonna jump ahead and say, Karen, you can introduce yourself and your awesome passion for what you do, but being a University of Vermont catamount, here's a tie to Pittsburgh. Uh, the catamounts are American Panthers, Cougars, Mountain Lions, and Puma. So there's a tie there in addition to CMU, and there you have it with Karen Lightman. So 
the floor is yours, lady. That's great. Um, hey, it's great to be here uh, amongst friends and, and new colleagues as well. I'm the executive director of Metro 21 Smart Cities Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. I'm coming up on my four year anniversary, Ben. Can you believe it? It's crazy how the, the and I would say, you know, the journey of smart cities, what a difference between four years ago and today. And I, um, you know, I, today I really want to talk about kind of reclaiming the smart in smart cities and talking about how it can be a tool for equity and inclusion. And I think Robotics is a great example of that because the tool that they've developed doesn't care how rich the zip code is or you know, the, de the socio-demographics of an infrastructure or a road. It really cares about, you know, the, it's, it's just neutral. <laughs> and I, I think the idea of design of using tools like technology that are, that are developed at Carnegie Mellon and deploying them to solve real world problems, improve efficiency, reduce inequity, save money, <laughs> create jobs, you know, all those things are what smart cities should be all about. So I, we have about 20 active projects right now. We're, we're beyond the borders of Pittsburgh. We're throughout the 10 county region of Southwestern Pennsylvania, in fact, um, because we really also realize that a smart city cannot exist if it's surrounded by suburbs and rural areas that are disconnected. And so, you know, we, we see things from a regional perspective, we see things from a connectivity and that's physical and digital connectivity. So broadband is a big drum that I like to beat um, because we can have all this great technology, but if you can't get service, if you can't get cell service, you can't get Wi-Fi, it might as well not exist. Uh, so I, I'm really excited about today's conversation. Um, our website, metro21.cmu.edu has a lot more information. Um, and you know we're so proud of the robotic story, and we um, we have we have a few more. <laughs> we've we've helped with my sister organization, Traffic Twenty One. We've helped launch over ten companies in the past twelve years, and um, there's few a few more even in stealth mode. So the, I think that's what's exciting is the time is right now, and also we have this once in a lifetime infrastructure bill, hopefully to be passed soon, where we'll see an opportunity to build back better and, you know, smarter and more connected and more equitably and inclusively. 100%. And, and Karen, before we move over to Bruce, and I think, Bruce, you'll be able to resonate on this or you'll be able to elaborate that, you know, that the term uh, build back better, the infrastructure bill, it's in the news, folks, planes, trains, roads, automobiles, everything that we use on a daily basis, the water we drink, the air we breathe. This is what we're talking about. Cities, communities, municipalities depend on something that's the driver that allow us in this case you know what the great work ben and the team at robotics are doing is to make sure that our roads and highways are safe right the cars are safe we have to make sure that humanity uh, uh benefits from the coolness of technology yes but the safety that it'll provide so um yes please shoot out any links uh in terms okay, of great. verbal I'll and tell that. people and uh for my guests if you don't mind just don't go on mute because I'm going to have to click it off and I'm getting used now to the reality that uh, if I do that, I have to allow you to speak and I don't want to have to allow you. So uh, you just should go ahead and do it. Um, Bruce. All right. Bruce Walker, folks, friend, colleague, amazing human being. Um, 2017 confirmed by the U.S. Senate for the Department of Energy's Assistant Secretary for the Office of Electricity position. Uh, about as regular, great human being as you can get. Um, he knows critical infrastructure inside and out. He knows the energy sector. He has served in an operational capacity back in his days uh, with Con Edison. He's been the deputy county executive for Putnam County, New York. So he has that perspective of what it's like to be boots on ground in a city and the impact on constituency. He has a research and development aptitude. He's, a, he's an attorney, he's a lawyer. He is from, or comes to us by way of Manhattan College where they are the Jaspers, if I'm not mistaken, um, Bruce. And I, want to see Jas you off one. I just want to see you pivot off the Jaspers. Well, I'm going to pivot off Jasper, my friend, because if it wasn't for brother Jasper, we wouldn't have the seventh inning stretch in Major League Baseball because way back in the day when students were restless, brother Jasper told the students during the seventh inning to relax and not be so crazy. And he allowed people to get up and he held the game up for a bit of seventh inning stretching so there you have it there's my brother jasper it doesn't tie into pittsburgh right away but at the end of the day i, I thought we we're gonna go down neat. the catamount path oh yeah catamounts we got catamounts we got jaspers we've got jumbo the elephant and of course uh we've got pit panthers and uh 
There you go, Dr. Ben. All right, Bruce, um, uh, you, you have a decorated career and, and the ARC, the Analysis and Resilience Center for Systemic Risk addresses finance, it addresses energy, and it really overarchingly is, 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 is taking on all of the 16 sectors deemed most critical, transportation being one of them, and that's a theme for today. Can you talk a little bit about uh, you know, that role you're in currently and the impact that working at DOE had for you on this you know, discussion of smart everything? Yeah, I, you know, I just want to take a second and thank you and, and, and Michael uh, for the work you guys are doing. As you well know, uh, you know, the whole smart grid idea is near and dear to my heart. Uh, and in the mid 2000s, uh, founded the, the Global Smart Grid Federation uh, while working Gridwise Alliance. So, you know, I've been kind of looking at these things and it, it is a, it's just a passion of mine. Um, so this is just a great opportunity. I'm, I'm thrilled that you chair the, the, the super cluster. Uh, for a sector like mine that I'm near and dear to energy, uh, but I'm also passionate about water and things and things like that. So, you know, what we do at the ARC is we focus in on, uh, particularly across the energy and finance sector, uh, identifying where we have systemic risk that uh, has the ability to uh, negatively impact the entire sector. And so, you know, what we try to identify is where those touch points are, the interdependencies, codependencies, and then develop mitigating solutions or operating strategies to, to basically get rid of them and move them out of the way. Uh, but all the while, we're very much focused on, you know, not losing efficiencies, optimizing utilization of resources, you know, human capital, all the things that come into play. Uh, very hard focus on cyber, uh, cyber physical threats, uh, which is something that I think, you know, as we get into uh, the further development of, of the smart cities, which a uh, huge fan of, I did a lot of work with IBM back in the day on, on the smart cities initiatives they had, uh, but really doing it with a, an eye of engineering uh, and doing the work up front to really mitigate the risk as it goes in, right? So in like cyber world, we look at consequent driven cyber informed engineering, right? So we build in that, that type of thing before we put uh, different pieces of equipment into our operational technology uh, throughout the energy sector. And so, you know, these are things and, and opportunities that we've got. And, you know, as, as Karen noted, you've got this monumental infrastructure bill and, and boy, it couldn't come at a better point. You know, I was reading an article on the American uh, Society of, Engin of Civil Engineers and the, there were a couple of things that, and I usually read that every, comes out every four years, uh, but the one I follow the most is water because it's, it's, it's one that it, I'm, I'm passionate about. And, you know, one of the highlights they had in the 2021 report is, there is a uh, water main break every two minutes with an estimated 6 billion gallons of water waste of, of treated water wasted on a daily basis. And so for somebody like me, you know, I, I shut the water in the shower and I'm shaving or brushing my teeth, right? Cause you're trying to save that five gallons here and there, but you know, you start talking about smart, smart infrastructure. You've got things like drinking water, wastewater, right? We've got, 16,000 wastewater facilities around the country, 15% have reached or exceeded their, their, their capacity. Roads, right, big area, one that is very much focused on, you know, just sitting in traffic uh, costs people well over a thousand, two thousand dollars a year, not to mention the negative impact that it has on, uh, on the environment. We've got this huge opportunity of, you know, the potential for autonomous vehicles uh, that were right on the precipice of being able to do that incorporates some of the work that I think, uh, you know, Ben talked about earlier. Uh, and then you've got things like solid waste, which, you know, you guys look at too from your super cluster, right? And we're producing 268 million tons of missile waste a day. It's about four and a half pounds per person per day. Uh, some of these numbers are just astronomical and, and 50 some odd percent, 53% of that goes into landfills, right? So when you look at all the things that cities are involved with and in trying to manage roads, waste management, not to mention energy, um, the drinking water, and then you have storm water, right? So you've got six, 600,000 miles of rivers and streams and 13 million uh, acres of lakes and, and reservoirs that are considered impaired, not usable. Um, and so all of these things, we have an opportunity to influence as we build out these smart cities and, and really optimize the utilization of the sensing technology and, and some of what Ben talked about with using AI and machine learning uh, to build those models, you know, that, that can really highlight correlation, eliminate interdependencies and dependencies and figure it all out, right? And come up with good engineering solutions. You know, um, 
Bruce, and 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna pivot back to Ben. And again, I'm gonna encourage my 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 guests today to to feel free to don't wait for me to prompt you. It's Pete. I got a question. Shut up for a minute. Um, and then our 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 chat uh, are coming in. I've already got six questions being asked. I did release a poll just now or a few minutes ago that is is really you know what are some of the challenges facing uh, a, a smart city deployment? And I think we'll hit on some of that. And that's a lot of the work that Michael's leading. Uh, which is vast and it's not just you know go after an rfp and then you're the smart city integrator you've got to think about this if you're in the beltway my world uh you know this is where mission and mandate coincide folks uh infrastructure bill will turn into funding will turn into agencies to uh, receive appropriated dollars to go back out to industry and this is where if you sell into the government you're selling to the mission of what the cities we as residents citizens whatever you want to refer to us as need to make our highways safer and to use the technology uh, to enable that. So a um, little bit of a soapbox there. All right, Ben, um, can we jump into uh, entrepreneur that you are? You obviously had a vision. Uh, there are autonomous vehicles running around in Silicon Valley, LIDAR running across the top of a car, taking pictures. What makes your robotics um, solution or solutions as you continuously evolve uh, I don't want to say better, but but more uh, efficient potentially. And how is it adding value in these, you know, 250 governments, you know, worldwide? Uh, sure, that's a very good question. And I would say um, maybe the easiest way to put it is that it's it's simple. Um, so you know, one of the things that we've certainly found in our time and working with governments and selling to governments is that the solution has to be now, uh, and it has to be easy to adopt. Um, so, you know, when we first got started, uh, and even to this day, uh, largely our clients collect their data using a smartphone. Um, that goes up onto our cloud platform, at which point we can then process it and look for, run all the machine learning, um, quality control it, and then deliver back the answer of sort of like, what is the condition of the roads? What are the conditions of their um, other infrastructure assets? Uh, deliver that back to them and make it this really kind of seamless and kind of nearly magical experience where they don't have to do a lot of upfront or heavy lifting in that process. Uh, that I think is, is certainly one of the, the kind of keys to adoption for a lot of this technology is that um, I think there's a little bit of a tendency to look at the whiz bang solution, the maybe one day this thing will solve all the problems, um, which is great. We certainly shouldn't stop you know looking at that uh but ultimately i think from kind of the entrepreneurial you know in the trenches working on right now um kinds of problems we need right now solutions um so we need things that we can take off the shelf and deploy that have been sort of like battle tested in the real world um and then to get the adoption up right because we can shave you know five ten twenty percent now um or we can wait until the hundred percent solution is available maybe five years, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years from now. Um, and, you know, as, as uh, other panel members have talked about, um, those savings immediately are what we need, right? We, we can't wait for the final solutions that really sort of solve everything. We need the incremental advances. Um, so that, that would be certainly my, my biggest sort of, uh, you know, what do we differentiate on is that yeah, we have the 200, 300 clients that we've worked with we know it works, we know it can be deployed. And so that really gives it this ringing endorsement of, you know, we're ready to go. You know, you, you sign on with us and been there, done that. Like, you know, we, we can work on it. And, and Ben, this is Bruce, I have a question for, for Ben. So, so how adaptable is it to, uh, from a modeling perspective to really pull in any type of asset, given a set of criteria that'd be evaluated for? Uh, so certainly where we got started was on roads. So looking for things like distresses on roads, potholes, cracks, et cetera. Right. Um, that, that we've, I'd like to think we've nailed it, right? We've got that one. Um, I've used, as I've we've, used the technology there. So the, I'm familiar with that. <laughs> yep. So, so the, the other components are certainly going to be an iterative process. So things like signage detection um, are, are pretty well in hand. Um, looking for like, uh, guardrails, street lights, traffic lights, a lot of those are automatically detected. Um, you know, and I think that's kind of the, the practical answer to your question. The, the sort of um, bigger question, I think anytime we talk about AI or machine learning sort of applications is always around kind of the accuracy trade-off. Um, so even if I ask kind of, 
our entire panel to go out and do the same kind of survey manually, uh, we'll still have some error, right? We'll miss a few signs, we'll miss a few traffic lights, we'll miss a few something like that. Though there will be an error. Um, and so I think that's really the question here is what is that trade-off for uh, using an AI model? We can quantify it a lot better. Um, and I apologize. Now my dog's going to join the conversation. Very passionate, passionate it. dog. I love it. it sure. I love it. Um, High five to the pooch. <laughs> can I add on to what Ben was just talking about as well? You got it. Because Go the CTO of Robotics is Professor Christoph Martz in the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon. And I think what's exciting is a project that I've been working with him on is using the same tool or a modified version of that tool to predict landslides. Um, there goes my dog. And it was this idea of, you know, the, because of climate, um, the, the, at least the, the Northeast is getting wetter and hotter. And then we have this crazy clay soil that um, is an and infrastructure and more land use. And we've had a, a, a lot of landslides that is, you know, billions of dollars. Like you were, you were listing all the inefficiency of water. Landslides are costing lives. They're costing jobs. Um, they have billions of dollars of impact annually. Uh, and, um, you know, we could use that tool that was developed first for potholes and now use that as a tool. And, and what we're doing is we're doing a demonstration project where it's on a bus route. So it's this idea of the, the same route every day and it's looking for differences. It's, and it's doing that edge computing um, and then um, recognizing when there's a change in, in the road. Oh, I see our... Our poll yeah. stats have come up. Yeah, well, well, I wanted to go there because, you know, Karen and, and Bruce, and let me come back to Michael. Michael, you're leading this Global City Teams Challenge. And it's a, you know, it's a it's an ongoing challenge, right? Folks, this isn't like a one and done. This is the GCTC. It's part of NIST. And Michael, you're leading NIST's efforts now globally. Can you speak to looking at those poll results, you know, active uh, uh, actionable collaboration, uh, engaging the state local, what are some of your challenges as a federal employee pushing this agenda for cyber physical and the technology aside to bring the communities together? What is something you're seeing in your recent back into government, you know, having served our country, by the way, thank you for your service, um, that you find to be um, so important and needed? And so, B, I'm glad you raised this question. So I'm looking at these results right now, and they actually surprise me. Um, and that may be because of my association with the GCTC. Uh, so before I became, just a few months ago, took over as a leadership in this, in this position, I, I was the, one of the co-chairs of the public safety super cluster. So I've been associated with GCTC for quite some time now. I've worked at the university levels in both the University of Louisiana and in uh, University of Cincinnati on smart cities. So I've seen this from the perspective of organizations that have the passion of the like the people that were on that are on this panel right now um i'm i'm always surprised to find that the lack of buy-in at the municipal private and community levels tends to rise to the top and it's not for a lack of interest or dedication or any or even for a lack of funding, quite frankly. Well, if, if there's anything, it's a lack of funding, but that really gets to the issue of lack of priority or the inability to make priorities that go deeper than maybe one or two or three. So the, the, the lack of buy-in isn't so much a lack of enthusiasm often at the community level, it's a lack of, of, of capability and, and inability to muster the resources that are necessary to really cut a broad swath on the problem of, of improving city services, but also in inserting technology, high technology in city services that already exist in legacy systems. Um, it's hard, so, so it's hard work. I think that's the issue. It, it's it's it really is very hard. hard to it, do. It does not just self-assemble like little nanoparticles. It takes an active, steady, engaged, thoughtful hand. And then there's that word, the P word, procurement that could kill anything, right, Ben? You know, like, it's not trivial. Yes, well, I think I, I, that would I, always be my comment is when it takes my company as much work to get a $5,000 deal across the line as it does to get a $250,000 line, dollar uh, deal across the line, that's the challenge. I have a technology that, you know, I can adopt readily and, and as I said, kind of offers that like magic. But unless I'm interacting with the city, it's probably not worth my while to sort of look at the procurement 
um, challenges that go along with it. And, and not to mention the fact that it doesn't scale. One city's procurement, one municipal's procurement is not the same as the next. And so we have to navigate each one. We have to redline each contract every single time without fail. Our lawyers are involved on every single transaction. Um, those are some of the really big impediments to just adopting or even selling. You know, it doesn't even have to do with like actually using the technology, just to even show it to someone. Um, big challenges there, big, big challenges. You know, I'm, getting, get, I'm sorry, or just I'm getting back to the question that Pete asked just a second ago, I, I think, and, and this, was, this was the issue having to do with what is the federal role in all of this, Pete? Uh, so in the smart cities community, and this is what we're trying to do in GCTC, uh, is provide a venue for the sharing of these kinds of best practices. And we've been concentrating largely on the, on the, on the good practices. What has worked well in a city? Where have we made advantages? What, is, what has been the benefits? Um, there are, as we all know, there are as many good lessons to be learned from what did not go well. And where are the liabilities that one community has already learned through hard experience that might solve <clears throat> another community's problem if they had the infrastructure for the information sharing on a broad scale? And I think to get to the issue, the main, uh, probably the most important issue in a collaboration like this, Pete, the role that the federal government can play, and this is what we try to do at GCTC, and definitely at NIST, is to provide that venue for that information sharing. And, and, and also to provide an honest, uh, to serve as an honest broker where we can get access to technologies that maybe only have a few um, opportunities for, uh, for market share in one community, but when you expand that across communities in a region or even communities in a state, suddenly the market share looks like it would be uh, a, a tenable proposition for a private sector company to pursue. Whereas if they're working just on one-offs, it, it, it's very difficult to make that happen. As Ben probably realizes, I can see him smiling. <laughs> yes, um, you've definitely nailed it. <laughs> hey, Bruce, you had a comment. I did, and it, and it really dovetails to a point Ben raised and, and Michael as well. And that is, you know, part of the fluctuation that's realized within the cities and counties throughout the United States is really a direct correlation to their to the political whims of whoever the elected officials are, and you can't, you know, we as we try to push this can't underestimate that that change in in leadership, you know, changes what the priorities are, uh, you know, every whatever period of time they're being elected, um, but you know also it gets directly to Ben's point. They want they want to take action and do something that's going to be visible right now, because they want to be able to use it for reelection. And so, you know, this whole idea of being for them to build capability and do R&D and planning and not produce anything is counterintuitive, right? Which is where I think NIST plays a, a vital role and, and particularly through the super clusters to really be able to accelerate all those local uh, initiatives by having these, you know, guidelines and the frameworks and, and the best practices and all those things. So, you know, it can bring it to something that is more tangible today for whoever the elected, you know, uh, official is that comes into play. Let me, let so, me, uh, oh, go ahead, Ben, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna add one of the, so one of the other um, thinking about kind of like counterintuitive ideas, you know, one of the things that we certainly didn't expect when we started is that, you know, we were looking at, you know, mid tier cities, right? That's where our original sort of target sweet spot was for kind of road assessments, thinking that's where a lot of the smart city parts are, that's where a lot of the innovation is. Um, and I don't mean anything against kind of that community. I do think there is a lot of willingness for adoption. One of the most fascinating things we found is that our quickest adopters, our early adopters, were actually small towns. Um, so suburbs, rural, um, you know, again, it's, it's kind of the, as you were saying, um, Bruce, kind of, it's the right kind of climate in that particular town, the right folks in there who have that innovative mindset with the difference being that they don't have a large apparatus to sort of stop them or slow them down. Um, and so one of the things that I, I think is always very fascinating in kind of like smart city conversations is that I, I do believe, you know, even just, you know, our own interactions with our clients, some of our absolute, you know, smartest, most innovative clients are actually small towns that you wouldn't know unless you knew that sort of like region. Um, they are the lead thinker, uh, even beyond the city in that area. 
um, in terms of their adoption of technology. They're sort of like, use this, don't use that kinds of um, approaches. So from a business perspective, that's who we've kind of looked at are those early adopters. But I do think it's this potentially untapped resource of they're very small, they're nimble, they can adopt a technology and then leave it and drop it. There aren't that many consequences for it versus a city which might have an existing enterprise um, system. They have um, bigger sort of larger integration challenges. So it's a, it's a whole other kind of like, again, did not expect it when we started this, but this kind of like hidden other world of municipals and governments that are truly small, innovative, the, the early adopters of these smart city kind of technologies that are just fascinating. They're like their own interesting use case um, for the kinds of technology we're talking about here. So. I, I want to inject, uh, first of all, keep the questions coming in, folks. Some of you, if you have a question for one of our, our panelists who are, 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 are monitoring as well, there could be a question in there that, you know, you know Michael, Karen, Ben, and or Bruce want to just shoot a response to. Shout out to uh, Rox for asking a question that I think we are addressing is, you know, how smart uh, the Internet of Things, the Industrial Internet of Things, the data, how are we sharing data? Another question came in, you know, how are we enabling that? You know, Ben, it's one thing to say we collect it, aggregate it, put it in the cloud, and then we do some analysis. You know, when you have it, there's obviously some information that, that others can benefit from. Can you and or Karen and, you know, Mike jump in here and even Bruce from a risk standpoint, this sharing of information, the equity, the unbiased data, can we kind of address that and, and talk to, hey, if it's a challenge, how can we improve it? And also, what is having that intelligence that share doing to help, you know, move that needle, even at those levels that are the small municipality versus, you know, the gargantuan large city at the mayor level or the city government, which can be, you know, bureaucratic. So, so let me put that out there because that'll answer a couple of the questions flowing in. Why don't we start with Michael? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I think, I think the, the, the objective here is to frame the data in a way that can be usable and scalable from a small community up to a large one and back down again. And that has its own set of challenges for obvious reasons having to do with, with what is appropriate within a small community for the use of data and where do, you put the, where do you put the emphasis on data collection analysis and what are the priorities the city has for using that. And those priorities can be completely different from one jurisdiction to another. In fact, jurisdictions have it within, ranging from communities to counties to regions and states, have nested jurisdictional issues regarding what the urgency of, of, of data acquisition is and use. And so the, the scalability problem isn't, it, it's a function for one thing of, 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 um, of, of data analytics and systems that can manage data, but it's different. It it's also has a dimension having to do with culture and having to do with the appropriateness of of data collection and utilization within one community that has a certain set of jurisdictional priorities or, or imperatives, in fact, relative to the jurisdiction that it may sit inside of. And so those are different sets of problems than simply scalability, but they really touch on some of the, uh, on some of the issues that I think communities have to deal with and they live with on a, on a routine basis. Um, so I, I wanted to get back to a point that, uh, that Bruce raised just a couple minutes ago about the imperative that, that, that leadership and that elected officials have to make good during an election cycle on something they can deliver to their communities. And this kind of gets to this issue. Um, one of the things we're doing at NIST right now is to try is, is developing a process for what we're calling holistic key performance indicators, uh, a set of of KPIs in the smart city space in various areas of, of, um, of, uh, of uh, infrastructure, critical infrastructure and sectors that can then be used to analyze on a, on a holistic basis what the priorities for a community could be. And the gain of that is that it will provide the ability of an elected official to say, this is the path that looks best for us to go because we have the data that can show it. And we can prove it because we've run an analytic tool provided by NIST that is basically available to anyone uh, for the use in that community. And it will help answer those questions uh, as long as the data can be gathered and used. So there's, a, you know, there's, a, there's another challenge nested inside that one. But I think we're making progress incrementally in all of those directions. Then what are your thoughts on this data sharing? And then Karen, uh, you as well, do you hear that, you know, uh, 
it's one thing to keep it in house because it's intellectual property, but it's another thing. What can others learn from? How do we, you know, improve sure. upon that? Sure. So I would, um, I, I think I like to think of the the value side of it in sort of two directions. One that's a little hard to quantify, and then one that's easier to quantify. The harder to quantify is that, um, you know, so we have about three hundred different governments we work with. Without fail, um, the process they had before us sort of involved somebody jumping in a truck with paper and pen, driving around, taking a look at the infrastructure, compiling that into some sort of notes, um, and then basically making judgment calls off of that. And those judgment calls are at the staff level, so kind of unelected government officials making decisions all the way up to elected officials making budget choices about where to allocate dollars. Um, so you have kind of this subjective, potentially incomplete, potentially non-existent sort of data source that's feeding all level of government decision-making on how to proceed. Um, the part that's hard to quantify is that if you come in with a data set that is based on machine learning, a reproducible system, a unbiased kind of third party, not sort of internal, um, that you can continue to collect that data, all of a sudden that same decision-making pipeline is now relying on a set of data that you can sort of audit where it came from um, and then make those decisions. So that's that's kind of the first kind of hard thing to see with when you have the data, all of a sudden you get this unlocked potential of reproducible data set. Um, on the other side of it, uh, you know, the really exciting part is, okay, great. Now we have kind of fundamental data and we're making decisions about it. The part that's easier to quantify is that previously you would make a decision um, and it would be challenging to understand what the impact of that decision was. If we increase budget or we shift budget from this part of town to that part of town, or we work on our water systems versus our road systems this year, implement a new you know, uh, road opening sort of policy. It's hard to quantify that because again, you don't really have necessarily data upon which to make those judgment calls. All of a sudden now, your policies, you can see their effect um, and how they're being sort of looped back into the data as you continue to collect it. Now, I guess this would be the third area of value, which is all of a sudden those policies that this particular town has enacted um, can actually be shared with other communities. When we enacted this policy or when we started to pursue this kind of approach or change this budget item, this is what we saw and this is how we quantified it. Um, and so our expectation is that, you know, the town won over would have sort of similar ramifications. All of those things are basically the long winded way of saying what I think people normally refer to as just data driven decisions. Um, and that's what's really, really exciting about this is that sharing amongst communities becomes exciting. Sharing within that community becomes exciting. Uh, and it all rests on having a really good understanding of what the world looks like at the moment. Um, Sorry, that was long-winded, but hopefully- Oh, no, I love it. Karen, Karen, can you speak to, and then Bruce, I'd like you to address, there's a world of utilities there that are like, no way, we don't need to share and there's reasons for it. And I'm not trying to look at the glass half empty, but Karen, can you talk a little bit about that? We've talked about it in the past, this, the power of data turning into information that can provide insight for us to, to you know, for humanity to, to live safer and, and so forth. What are your thoughts on this data sharing? Yeah, you know, it's- I it's really interesting. I think this issue of trust is so critical and I, um, the, the tech backlash is extremely real. So my view on data, I think has evolved in that um, disaggregated data oftentimes can, can give so, such overgeneralized views of things that you lose the nuance, you lose the individual, you lose the communities, you, you lose those that are left behind. So I think you need to, when you design your system, you are thoughtful and intentional and you are doing it in a user-centered design way so that the data you collect is reflective of the community you're trying to serve and is addressing the problem you're trying to serve. You know, the garbage in, garbage out is so critical in, in and we have, we have an ability to get so much data. And sometimes when you 
scrub it and you take out all the identifiable information, you can lose some of that richness. So I think it's, you've got to be very thoughtful and intentional in how the data is collected, designed to be collected, collected, disseminated, distributed, interpreted, and you need to do that in an iterative way. Um, we are getting, you know, there's, <laughs> we, we know this, and with, with, with the ubiquitous broadband and connectivity and more um, IoT sensors, we have the potential to have even more, but we need to be really thoughtful and intentional about how we do that. So I, I don't like giving a blanket answer because I think it's really complicated. And then there's, and it goes back to this issue of trust and I'm um, the co-chair of the World Economic Forum's Trustworthy IoT Coalition. And we're specifically looking at this issue when you are, you know, you have Alexa in your home and you have a ring doorbell and you have all these things that are listening and watching you. And the user really has no idea what's being used by that data. So transparency is important. And also I want, as an individual, I want agency, I want a choice. Like I'm deciding to give that data because I like the luxury of Alexa telling me what the weather is, you know? But maybe I, I'm okay with just open up the door and looking outside and see what the weather is like our grandparents or parents used to do. You know, give me that choice. And so I think it's, that's why transparency is really important. Um, and, and we need to be having more of this coalition building corporations need to be a part of it. My vision is that companies will want to be, want to build trust in a true and transparent way because they want that to be a part of their ethos, right? And it's not in Google we trust um, or, you know, as I jokingly say, like, don't worry your pretty little head about this. It's too complicated. If I had to explain it to you, you wouldn't understand. No, you know, like treat people with respect and you'll gain their trust. Um, so with the data question, I guess, is a lot. My long-winded answer is: um, I think you need to be really careful, thoughtful, and intentional how you, how you, you know, that whole pipeline of how you use the data. And at the end, I love you know robotics. I think you know their tool is it's it can be a tool for equity for that reason. Yeah, I, I think you used a lot of words that I know, Michael, you're nodding that are in the definition of GCTC and yes, cyber physical systems and protecting data. You know, I think, again, to the Beltway community that is selling into government um, quite a bit. Uh, these are where you could take the power of data, solving problems and challenges, not just to say we can collect it and aggregate it, but we can curate it in a way where you can share some and protect it for, for internal purposes. So, I mean, again, I, I do a lot of consulting and advising to companies on messaging and building that trust, as you mentioned, and we need more of that coalition building with, with that spirit of trust. And we have a poll out there and I appreciate everyone responding to that, which is, you know, partnership. I think it was uh, what, what seems to be leading the, the pack here is partnership opportunity. So I'm gonna ask my guests to, you know, however today and, and continue through, and we'll share that, how we can engage with the GCTC NIST with Metro 21 Robotics, if you're doing some, some neat stuff with some of your colleagues. Um, and again, I'm gonna ask our uh, panel, our guests when they join even this late into the program, if you could just keep your video off, that would be, be appreciated. Bruce, if you can um, speak to as a sort of a, a, a by an agnostic in this, when, when you hear about, you know, we need more collaboration and protecting data, you come from a world where data is protected. What, what are you now in this role out there saying, look folks, you know, we're talking about distributed energy. We're talking about bringing together data sets and information to create a more secure grid, a resilient transportation sector, cleaner water. How are you driving that discussion? And is there pushback? Or are you starting to see some cracks in the cement where people want to collaborate and share data? Yeah, so, you know, it's an interesting question, and, and, and in listening to, to Ben, Michael, and, and Karen, there's lots of ways to approach this, and that have been approached in, in, the, in the past, if I look back into the energy sector, right? In the energy sector, th there are things that are, and have been shared for decades between utilities, right? So back in 1998, basically, many of the utilities became, uh, you know, uh, deregulated, meaning we basically broke out T&D and generation and the T&D companies <clears throat> fundamentally were regulated. And so there's, there's always been a willingness amongst utilities to share data that's relevant, right? And I think it gets back to, 
you know, are we collecting the right data? And, and the joke we always talk about in the energy sector is, you know, the same system that you have today, we used to run 30 years ago on, you know, 1200 baud modems. So the fact that we have now with this broadband and we have tons and tons of data, you know, we were able to make decisions back then, right? So basically we operated the system by exception, um, which, you know, decreases the, the amount of data you need, but gives you visibility into what actions have to be taken. And, you know, there's lots of examples. I mean, for the, the LIDAR that Ben uses on, on his vehicles, you know, we've used in the energy sector for at least 30 years um, for the purposes of, of flying our transmission lines and really mapping out all the assets on the transmission lines to do, you know, kind of performance-based uh, engineering analysis and, and the asset management standpoint. You know, as we we come together and we're, we're working through like the arc and, and critical infrastructure, uh, you know, the sharing of information becomes critically important, but there's really a focus on making sure we're collecting what's, what is important, right? We don't need any personal information. We're running a, a system based on physics, right? So it's, it's a little easier where we don't have to worry about, um, you know, per PII, you know, pop it into the, into the substation. Um, so, you know, the key for us is is figuring out how to manage the data, but you know, getting back to to Ben's point, what, what I would push towards is, you know, number one, really taking the discipline to really figure out at a at a root cause perspective what pieces of information are valuable, which ones provide insight, and, and insight to what, right? What what piece of information perhaps correlated with other pieces of information help drive a decision or an operating decision. Um, and much of what's being talked about and in, in some cases being done in the, in the energy space and other places is this edge computing, right? To get away from some of this data management uh, issue and big, big data analysis is being able to capture pieces of information at the location where it can be utilized. Um, and if you think of simple things like, you know, I always relate to things back in my house, right? Because it's just so much easier to do. When I think about how in the United States, we have like hot water heaters all over the entire United States, people use them, they leave their house for leaves or leave their house for a week, and they leave the hot water heater on with zero chance of anybody using that hot water heater. Right now, there, there's, there should be mechanisms whereby, like, you know, if your phone goes away, and you're in Hawaii, and your, your hot water heater is on in New York, it should just shut it off. Nobody's there. Um, but really, you know, bringing big things back down to very tangible, you know, useful things inside the house, I think, and then extrapolating that into the big projects like Ben has, and then bigger things like the smart city. Um, you know, I look at those as tremendous opportunities with the data. Uh, and, you know, what, if you can show value based on the data you collect and analyze, then I think there, that's part of the building of trust. Um, you know, if you can't articulate why you're collecting the data, then people aren't gonna trust why you are collecting the data. And I, and I think that's a question for, again, those, you know, selling, whether it's, you know, it could be Ben, you, you saying, look, we got these great tools that we can help you, you know, with potholes and pavement and rutting and all these terms that I didn't even know existed when it came to the street just doesn't seem to ride very smoothly. Um, you helping companies think about whether it's the ones that went around and wrote the paper, how technology in this case can provide that intelligence to think differently about, you know, the collection of data and, and what they can do with it. So, so that, that really spoke to me in the robotics journey and, and I commend you and, and the team for that. And look, we've got six minutes left and we're getting into, and I know I could speak, I should, probably should have booked two hours for this. Uh, I'm going to go back to Michael and start with you know, Michael, before we hit the parting shots, I'd love to get some of your thoughts. And again, big shout out to NIST for sponsoring today. I mean, NIST is, uh, uh, to me, the most incredible, uh, since 1901, uh, if I'm not mistaken, institution that is just helping every agency and industry with measurement and sensing and, and analytics and, and data and read all the white papers on, you know, just how, whatever the domain is and what sector, uh, there can be so many lessons learned and, and recommendations. Um, you know, for entrepreneurs and folks who are doing, you know, the science behind so much technology. Michael, what, what is, what is, you know, you're, you're, you're done drinking out of a firehouse to some extent. What, what, what do you need more of from industry to help you, whether it's with GCTC and your role 
with cyber physical security. What is something you would like to see more of as you're looking to, you know, push this smart cities agenda forward? This is so, Pete. This is part of the uh, the question we're dealing with right now, and in, in the GCTC, and this is part of a strategy process we've got underway right now. Is um, we want to see a stronger relationship with industry in general, and partnerships have been at, at the community level, particularly. A lot of those have been small businesses, medium medium sized businesses, the ones that are the providers at the community level. Uh, we have a few fairly large size uh, corporate partners involved in GCTC, but there is an enormous amount of untapped talent in the private sector in the country that we simply need to mobilize, to use a military term, uh, more for the benefit of communities in general, but also for the benefit of these partnerships. So I think what one of our goals in the, in the near term, I hope for the GCTC, is to actually reach out to uh, corporate partners the way we have reached out to community partners and to broaden that base and again to make available the talent, the resources, the lessons learned, the, uh, the uh, good benefits that have been gained through sometimes hard experience and to, and to make those available for sharing at the community level. So any, everybody benefits, which is the real goal of the GCTC and of NIST as a federal agency is to establish systems, to establish measurement devices, and to establish approaches on complex problems that will benefit everyone. And so that's part of our, that's part of our, uh, our, our modus operandi, so to speak. There's a lot to pick a topic, go in the search bar, and there will be something that anybody who is building something or wanting to leverage can learn from. So, okay, Michael, that was, that was awesome and amazing. And hey, folks, uh, next week, Michael and I are going to be in the Smart Cities Connect conference. There's a big week or uh, several days of amazing stories and use cases next week, uh, 1021, Michael and I, Michael's going to have me as a guest, and I'm going to share some insight on the utility supercluster along with my colleagues uh, from other superclusters, and then the week after cybersecurity symposium for smart cities. So that's going to be addressed in the uh, cybersecurity month that we're in. Uh, Ann Duncan, the CIO at the U.S. Department of Energy, and I are going to have a little fireside <coughs> chat on, you know, she was the CIO for Santa Clara. So at that municipal level, this is a space, folks, if you're into uh, having a mission and a reason to be selling technology to support a sector, to support humanity, smart cities is it. So that was my parting shot. Bruce, take 30 seconds. What do you want to leave with the audience? Well, you know, I want to build on a point Karen brought up early. We've got this infrastructure bill. And let's hope it goes through. There's a lot of really good things in there, including some of the broadband she referenced earlier. Uh, you know, in, in hoping it goes through, I think I want to, you know, encourage everybody to really undertake thoughtful and comprehensive planning to maximize the utilization of those resources but also balancing the risk, right? And, and specifically, one of the things I think we need to be careful as we move forward in this space is really creating those inadvertent interdependencies and codependencies that actually further exacerbate the risk. Um, and again, I think thoughtful, good engineering, um, you know, relying on, on, on some government partners like NIST, private companies like, like Ben does, university like Karen works at it. I mean, you know, bringing all these, these these collaborative components together in partnership is really and with good debate. You got to have good debate. Um, and that's how you get to the best answer. So Love let's it. hope this all goes through. Thank you, Bruce. Always appreciate the feedback. Karen, you have the floor. Yeah, Bruce, well said. Um, I would say ditto. And, and then I think this issue of um, diversity, equity, inclusion is really important because we've left behind so many folks. Um, that we have an opportunity to do this well and do this inclusively um, so that we can build trust. And I also am a big believer in pilot projects. Um, that's, you know, that's the genesis of Ben's company, Robotics and many others, is this idea of co-creating co and collaborating with municipal and equity and community partners to get, you know, to work out those bugs, to address the risk, to those unintended consequences. Sometimes you have a technology that does stuff you did not intend for it to do and you shouldn't use it anymore. And you can't figure that out if you do a, a tiny little pilot or if you do something, you know, at, at huge scale, you've got to do something that's outside of the, the, the lab and take it to, um, and that's why we have, 
you know, five memos of understanding um, throughout the southwestern Pennsylvania region so that we can do these pilot projects and work out the bugs and work out the tweaks, launch companies like Bangs. Um, and in it, but it's going to take a village and it's going to take deliberate collaboration. And it was something that um, I was in a really great event in the past two weeks. It's called the Marshall Plan for Middle America. And it's really focusing on coal communities and former steel mill communities like Pittsburgh that got the stuffing knocked out and still haven't built back. And there's a, there's a great opportunity to build back better with a more focus that's on um, energy and, and grid and sustainability. And the concern, Bruce Katz, who was formerly with the Brookings Institute said, let's not focus too much on the planning. We got to focus on the doing, right? And so that's the, you know, kind of to your point, Bruce, is like, we just got to get it done. And um, and so I think we had this once in a generation opportunity with the infrastructure bill. Let's get it done. We have an opportunity. We need to work together. So, um, you know, let's take advantage of that and, you know, hold hands a little bit, you know, blue and and red unite so we can get this infrastructure bill passed thanks thank you karen ben ben give us uh, some parting shot in the five seconds as we're over time i would say we are standing by for the doing um that that would be the number one message here is we are happy to help where we can um and i am also just you know enormously grateful for everybody uh you know, on the panel everyone that's joined today everyone within this entire um, ecosystem of driving innovation and sort of moving government and how government operates forward. So I just enormously thankful for that. Uh, glad to be contributing in some way. Your your passion is contagious, and I love that you love what you do, and you're continuing to do it each and every day. And thank you, Ben. This was about the city of Pittsburgh, the entrepreneurial spirit, the role that that Metro Twenty One's played in, and of course the government and the perspective that we need. This is about a village. This is about moving that needle. Michael, finish this out. Just an, obser just an observation. Uh, so I've, I've been in a lot of these kinds of conversations. In the smart city arena, we always start by talking about technology, sensor systems, and infrastructure. We always end the conversation, and this is becoming more and more apparent as time goes on. We end it by talking about data, decision-making, and decision-makers, and trust. So that trend to start with technology and end with trust is beginning to be a definable characteristic of smart city conversations that I've seen at any rate. And, uh, let's hope it continues. I think Karen would vouch for that. You're carrying the torch. You are Mr. Smart Cities as far as I'm concerned, pal. And I, I have enjoyed working with you. Bruce, Karen, Ben, Michael, thank you, thank you, thank you. Again, shout out to NIST, Dave Woolman, Chris Greer, the great group out at, uh, at the National Institute for allowing this to happen. We will have more conversations like this. I want to thank you again. Keep connecting dots, building bridges, and, and, and valuing trust. That is what's needed, and, and it will be sustainable if done in the spirit of, of the greater good. So thanks to everybody for joining today. Thank thanks, you, everybody. Thank have you. a great day. Thank Bye -bye. you.